To be a Cleveland Brown was uh, really a dream come true for me. I, I felt like I hit the lottery when I got here. My success was such in wrestling that I wanted to know if I could make the big time, so I actually contacted Oklahoma State myself and said, you need another wrestler there. They took a look at my record and said yes. We got an RV, we headed cross country where our goal was to come to the last game. It was like a war zone back here. Welcome everybody to Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. Today we visit with the great Jerry Shurek, one of the greatest defensive linemen in Cleveland Browns history, 12 seasons with the Browns, and the 1976 Defensive Player of the Year. Welcome back to Cleveland, Jerry. How are you doing? Doing great, Jim. Happy to be here. What does that mean to you to come back? When you come back, does it tap a great deal of memories? Uh, it really does, you know, especially a couple of weeks ago, I went to training camp and seeing those guys hitting and, uh, you know, smelling the grass and that whole thing just really brings back a lot of memories. Tell me this, in those memories, what does it always mean to you to be associated with the Cleveland Browns? Uh, the Cleveland Browns, well, I, um, I guess I can explain it. I, I bleed brown and orange. Uh, I don't always watch all of their games, but uh, I'm, I'm pulling for them. I'm watching the scores. Uh, to be a Cleveland Brown was uh, really a dream come true for me. I, I felt like I hit the lottery when I got here. Um, I was uh, a second round draft choice out of Oklahoma State and uh, I was kind of a, a really a late bloomer even in college and I didn't really know until my senior year that I'd play pro. And when I got tapped by the Browns, you know, all those names just came flying in my head. Lou Groza, Jim Brown, Paul Warfield, just that cast of characters and I just thought, man, if I can only, you know, play a few plays for the Cleveland Browns, my life will be, you know, intact. You know, you're always regarded as one of the greatest defensive linemen in Cleveland Browns history. And you've just rattled off great names, and those are great names in pro football history, never mind just the Browns. But to be to bear that kind of a title, what does that mean to you? Because really across the board, people say Jerry Shirk, one of the all-time great defensive linemen in Browns history. You know, I, I still can't believe it. I mean, I really do feel like I hit the lottery coming to Cleveland and being able to perform for them. I can remember Jim, um, in the, in the games, even when you change the quarters, you change the ends of the field, even deep into my career, uh, just kind of walking down the other end of the field and looking up and seeing those 90,000 people and just going, I can't really believe that I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's a long way from Grants Pass, <laughs> Oregon. It is. Tell yeah. me about Grants Pass, Oregon. Grants Pass is a, is a small town in Southern Oregon. I was born and raised there. Uh, it's a big sports town. I grew up watching my local heroes and uh, I was actually kind of small and I, I wrestled and I didn't go, actually go out to fo to, for football until I was a senior in high school because we had such good teams and I thought, uh, you know, I'm not sure I can make it. So uh, I went out when I was a senior. I did pretty well and I got a, a work study scholarship to a community college and then I was on my way. Wow, your senior year. Right. They must have had great teams. You're one of the all-time <laughs> great defensive linemen. They did. Uh, Grants Pass. In fact, I'm going to get inducted to my high school Hall of Fame this summer. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. But they really did have great teams. I think the year before I went out, they won the state championship. That little town in Southern Oregon won the state championship in football. The mechanics uh, and the fundamentals of wrestling. Yes. Did it help you in football? It helped me a tremendous, uh, you know, it, tremendously. Uh, the things that I took from wrestling, one was the balance, the agility. Uh, when I got to even Cleveland Browns training camp, I wrestled at Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State is big time for wrestling. And when I got here and people were complaining about the workouts, I'm just thinking, man, they haven't seen workouts like, like I've seen at Oklahoma State. So it was the agility, the balance, the shape, and then that, uh, that thing about being the only guy on the mat, one person. So I took that into football. So that guy across from me, I thought, you know, when I was a heavyweight at Oklahoma State, I had to go out and I was the last guy on the mat. And if I beat this guy, sometimes we won the duel. If I lost, sometimes we lost the duel. So I took that into football. I just, I kind of zoned in and, and this is the guy I got to beat right across from me. So take me from Oregon to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Well, I went to a little junior college in Aberdeen, Washington. My uh, first coach was actually uh, Jack Elway. 
uh, John Elway's dad. He was my first football coach. He, in fact, he recruited me in Grants Pass. I was working for my father in construction, and I was mixing plaster, and I came down the ladder with a hod, and there was Jack Elway. I didn't know who he was, and he said, I'm Jack Elway. I'm from Grace Harbor Junior College, and I want you to play football for me. So he was the only guy that recruited me. So I went up there, and uh, I wrestled, and I had a lot of success wrestling. I, I didn't really know if I was you know, I even had it to, to what it took to make uh, community college football. And then I got in my first game and I went, oh, gee, I did pretty good. Maybe there is a future for me. So I made all league uh, uh, one year on defense and the next year in offense. And uh, my success was such in wrestling that I wanted to know if I could make the big time. So I actually contacted Oklahoma State myself and said, you need another wrestler there. So they took a look at my record and said yes, and then uh, they actually put me on a football scholarship there. Wow! Did you? But you really loved wrestling. I, I mean, I'm picking it. up a lot of wrestling. Right, right. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we used to watch the old black and white films of Oklahoma State uh, when I was in high school uh, wrestling, and always those uh, those those black uniforms with the orange stripes yeah, on sure. the on the victory stand. So wanted to do that. Football at Oklahoma State. Where was it at the time you were playing? Uh, football was not as good as wrestling. Uh, we had some mediocre teams. Uh, so I played there two years, my junior and senior year. We had a different coach each year. Phil Cutchin was the head coach my uh, junior year and Floyd Gass my senior year. I think my junior year we were three and seven. My senior year we were five and five, which was better. We had good players. We really didn't have a good system there. And so uh, football really wasn't king at the time. We had a small, smaller stadium. Uh, we would average about 20, maybe 25,000 people for a game. But at a wrestling meet, you would have packed house? At a wrestling meet, uh, we would have a packed house. So sometimes, uh, at the time, I think our field house uh, held 7,000 people and 7,000 people would show up. And when we wrestled Oklahoma, it was uh, televised uh, statewide. Yeah. How about that? How did the Browns find you? Uh, there was a scout who somehow tuned into me. His name was Sonny Keyes, and he was also a coach here. And then when I got here, he, he passed on within a couple years, but he told the defensive line coach, Dick Mojaleski, oh, about me. Yeah. Of course, Dick Mo Mojaleski is an ex-Giant and, and ex-Brown. Sure. So he was the defensive line coach, and so somehow those two put their heads together and convinced the, the draft team and Mr. Modell to draft me. And you went second round? I went in the second round. Were you surprised at that? I was pretty surprised. Uh, in my senior year, about, uh, you know, we had, what, 10 game, 10 game season, about my eighth game, a coach came to me and said, you know, those pro scouts are looking at you. They're going to draft you. They think they're going to draft you high. And I was very surprised. And then I was actually into my wrestling season. We were wrestling at Southern Illinois University uh, during the draft. There was no... Uh, hoopla at all about the draft. There was no TV show. There was no radio coverage right. or anything like that. So I remember I was working out, uh, getting ready for my match, and somebody said, you've been drafted by the Cleveland Browns. Mr. Art Modell is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. So that was my first contact with the Browns. Wow. Do you remember what he said? It was usually very short and terse, something <laughs> like, uh, well, Jerry, we're really happy to have you here, and uh, we're looking forward to, for you to have a great career with the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> That's my argument. That's pretty good, Jerry, <laughs> i got to tell you. <laughs> okay, so now you come. How are they at that point in time? What um, are the Browns? First, they... of, first of all, it was a strike year. It was 1970, so it was a strike year, so the veterans weren't in, which was to my benefit and some of the other rookies, too, because we got a longer look. And by the time they came in, I think it was the third or fourth week we were getting ready to play our first, first game. Um, they came in, and um, they, for whatever reason, they saw, you know, Coach Mojaleski saw something in me, and he put me on first team, and I started that first game actually uh, the first preseason game, we played the L.A. Rams in the Coliseum with Roman Gabriel, a guy I've been watching since I was probably in the you know eighth grade or something like that at quarterback, a big guy. And I can remember actually uh, playing pretty well that first preseason preseason game, and I broke through and I hit Roman Gabriel, who's what six four six five. I hit him and I just like slid down his leg because you don't have six foot four quarterbacks, <laughs> you know, in the big eight. 
And so on films, uh, a couple of days later, Coach Mojoleski said, uh, Jerry, in the NFL, you have to wrap them up. <laughs> <laughs> 1970, right? Right. Okay, isn't this Monday Night Football? It's the first Monday Night okay, Football. Okay, now game. let's go into that because that right. is, a, that's an American, you know, almost like an, a, an amazing night in American, not just in television or sports television, but just in America. Monday Night Football. Take me into that night. I mean, do, did you guys realize this is... This is, this is something that's really unique. We did not realize how big Monday night was going to be. We just thought it was another night. They were trying a football game out. We had no idea. They had no idea how big it would be. Uh, it was Howard Cosell's first game as a football announcer. Uh, so before the game, it was either Howard or somebody else interviewed Joe Namath, and he said, what are you going to do? Namus said, we're going to run at the rookie, Jerry Shirk, number 72 from Oklahoma State. So Cosell actually repeated that, I found out later. The Jets are going to go at Jerry Shirk <laughs> at the, all night long. <laughs> at the rookie. And that's what he liked to do. He liked a front runner. He liked a big name. So oh. he liked to, you know, because he was all over Muhammad Ali, you know, as far as the, the publicity and those guys would go back and forth. So I think he wanted to be connected a little bit with Joe. So during the game, I had good plays and I had bad plays, but whenever the ball was anywhere around me, I had missed the tackle. You know, there you have it again. Jerry Shirk misses another tackle, and uh, I didn't know this, uh, I, I, but I knew that, I, you know, I could have played much better. The game speeds up, yeah. even from preseason. When you're a rookie, you don't know it, but those guys are going 95%, and first First game, they're going 105%, and you're still at your, you know, 95 or 100 percent. So I had some good plays. I had some bad plays. We won on a late interception. Billy Andrews intercepted and, and iced the game. I was really excited that, to, you know, to play in this game. I'd been at Oklahoma State, 25,000 people. Uh, Cleveland Browns, 90,000 people with maybe 5,000 standing. I don't know where they sure. put those people, uh, but. So that, that night, I didn't sleep at all. I couldn't wait to, to read the paper. What kind of Browns teams were they when you came up in 1970 and, and on? Uh, the Browns had, had an unbelievable record up to that point. Okay. My first year, we were 7-7. Seven and, seven and, and then the second year, I think we were a little bit better, maybe a 9-5, and five and we made the playoffs, but we got beat the first round. And then we just had some, some mediocre years. Did you play the undefeated Dolphins? We played the undefeated Dolphins and we almost beat them. It was uh, my third or fourth year. It, Mike Phipps had actually had a really good year that year. Bill Nelson, who was the, the former quarterback, was his coach. And he coached uh, Mike through a, a tremendous year. And we went down and played the Dolphins when they were undefeated. And I think we might have been leading or tied with them in the sure. fourth quarter and then we had a punt block so I think we lost maybe by six points. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that would have been the, yeah. the signature <laughs> signature win. Now you were on winning Browns teams that went to the postseason. What was it like? We were really connected to the people. I mean we you know we were you didn't spend a lot of time in the bars but a little bit of time in the bars where you you know you'd see people and on the street and we just we knew how big football was in Cleveland we knew the tradition that uh, football was kind of invented down the road in you know Canton Maslin it wasn't the best of times for Cleveland as a city right but the, there were the Browns but they were we had the Browns and we knew that if we could win, it would lift the spirits of these people. And I think the best football teams really do connect with the, the town that they're playing in. So they're not just playing for themselves or their teammates or their coaches, although it's a big part, but they're playing for the people. And there's something to win for the people and something to pull together and pull their spirits up. And that's what we really wanted to do. So many people, you know, treasure that team. The cardiac kits. Right. But it started before 80, right? right? right. Did you sense that there was something 
good. I mean, you had the quarterback. Right. Even today, they say, you got to have the quarterback. You guys had him. Right. It took a while for him to, to become what he ended up being, right. the MVP in the league and this guy that could pull a rabbit out of a hat, like you said, in the last two minutes of a game. But could you sense we got something here, this, this could be really special? Well, you know, Jim, it seemed like what would happen is that uh, all through the 70s, one year the offense would be good, but the defense not so yeah, good, right. and then the defense would be good and the offense not so good. And it just happened that in 1980, both the offense and the defense played really well in the offense, you know, played outstanding but yeah you could see it you could see it with the players that were there you know Dick Ambrose and Lyle Alzado and uh, the Pruitts and it was a nucleus you could just feel it coming together but I'll have to say you felt it every year too you know even the years that we ended up what three and eleven four and ten it's like okay this this is going to be the year what uh, what told you when did you I have to retire I'm going to retire and was it difficult um, so I had three or four years with the helmets hitting me. Mm. Then they became the target. Nothing could hit me. I could only hit them. I could, if I could see the ball carry, it was like I could, I could take him down. I don't know how sometimes I got there. And then the injury started coming along. I started feeling the helmets again. Boom, boom. So we had the 1980 year. I came back to play in 1981. I was a pass rush specialist. I only got in a third down. My knee was hurting. I didn't ever get warmed up, and we had a very mediocre year, just won a few games, and I went home and I thought, you know, they're gonna look at the film, they're probably gonna cut me, so I better retire before they, they, they cut me. <laughs> Jerry, we asked you to bring uh, a prop, so to speak, a remembrance of your your playing days, and boy, you have brought something it's, that looks from the from the <laughs> Roman <laughs> warrior days. This is definitely in the Colosseum. They used to. <laughs> this definitely has not been sterilized, Jim. So this is actually a thigh pad. And when I started playing in uh, 1970, I came in and I uh, was getting the equipment together for the first game. And Jack Gregory was an All-Pro defensive end and kind of a mentor to me. And so he was taking a look at what I was doing with my pads. So you typically had like an inch of plastic on it. He goes, hey, kid, you don't need all that plastic. It's just going to absorb water, and you're going to be running around sloshing, and it's going to be heavy, and you're going to be lifting it every time you're lifting your legs. He says, all you need is the plastic insert. So there's like a, a white plastic insert, but to protect it from gouging your leg, we had to tape it. And it became probably a tenth of the weight of that thigh pad, and nothing is going to hurt you if it if it hits that guy. So what I did though, I just had a ritual, you know, all us players have our own little rituals. I had three or four rituals. One of the rituals was every time I played and I had a pad that was similar, I would put one or two wraps of adhesive tape around it. And I don't know why I did it, just a ritual. And so this particular pad was from a day when a lot of the, the uh, NFL fields were muddy. So yeah. if you did the, some sort of a, you know, CSI analyzation. Uh, <laughs> there would probably be mud from every football field in the NFL probably, at yeah. the time. Wow. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned Jack Gregory was kind of a mentor right. to you. Were you a mentor to some players? You know, I, I believe that I was. In fact, uh, when Clay Matthews came in, I saw that he was a tremendous talent. And we had some coaches uh, on the team at the time that were a little bit raw and you know they were kind of new coaches and I can remember once in fact Clay reminded me of it years later he made a beautiful move on film uh, during one of the film sessions and put his arm over and he got around the guy and he's like took straight off to the quarterback and one of the coaches said Clay don't do that don't and I knew that it was absolutely the right technique so I got him aside later and I said hey kid don't stop doing what you're doing and he, years later, he said, I really appreciated that. Jerry, you were, you got into photography. And uh, how did that hit upon you? What interest you, piqued your interest in that? Well, Jim, I got, I got injured in, uh, I believe it was 77, and I was out for a few games. And so there I was for the first time sitting around the locker room, and I was just fidgeting. I needed something to do. And I always loved photography, and some of the photographers, uh, came into the locker room so I'd start talking to him like Paul Tepley great photographer for what the press mm -hmm. and Ronnie Koontz especially yeah. for United Press International so speaking of mentors Ronnie became my mentor and I started asking him about equipment he said Nikon's the way to go so I bought equipment he first took me to the through the dark room 
I was pretty rough. I was a rookie for two or three years. Uh, but within about three years, I was good enough to run. He actually hired me to do some jobs, and I would shoot sports with him. Wow, so it was sports photography. Right, right at first, yeah. Wow, how yeah. about that? And did you broaden that out then? Uh, when I retired, I was a freelance photographer, so I did, uh, I did jobs for magazines, and I did uh, jobs for businesses, headshots and buildings, and still loved nature photography. And I actually went out, and I was living in San Diego at the time, and worked for Associated Press and, and shot some, um, some, both some Clippers games when they were in San Diego and some San Diego Charger games. All right, let's go through some of the uh, pictures, some of your favorite ones. All right, get some, so, some shots so, here. So, Jim, this was when I was injured. This is at Kent State, and I was just really starting to get in photography. If you look to the right of the picture on yeah. a stool is my camera. So I set it up, and I set the timer, and then I ran over really quick, and I lifted the weight up. The team was on the field. I was just waiting to get my knee better. Uh, I didn't realize at the time that th these are mirrored panels and the, the one panel is going right down the middle of my face. So, you know, being sort of philos philosophic and introspective when I looked at that and I went, yeah, that's just how I feel. I feel like, you know, part of me wants to be out in the field yeah. and the other part is, uh, you know, getting ready to, to retire. And there's, I think I actually call that split personality. That's well titled. Okay. And, and I had a muscle or two at the time. You did. You're looking <laughs> like you should have been on the field at that point. So this is actually Paul Farron. So two years out of football, I was retired for a couple of years. The NFL asked me to come back and do a story on training camp at Lakeland. And uh, it's very flat out there. And the training room is uh, right there where the doorway is, you know, coming in. So I saw this sort of a light situation one day, and I thought, if somebody comes and sits on that bench, that's going to be a good shot. And I was messing around looking through some magazines the night before, and I saw this uh, article that says, you can smear Vaseline on the side of your lens, and it'll do funny stuff if the light is really, really bright. And so I just gave it a try, and I shot a roll of film. So it turns out I didn't even know the guy. I didn't talk to him, didn't know who he was. I found out later it was Paul Farron. He was a free agent, I believe, offensive lineman. At this time, he weighed about 220, had a hurt shoulder. He came in, got an ice bag out of one of those uh, Gatorade uh, chests. Yeah. yeah, and threw it on threw it on his shoulder and just kind of slumped there. And it looks like I posed it, but I, I didn't didn't even say a word to him. I showed it to him, you know, a couple years later. He's really happy to have that copy. He went on to gain maybe 40 pounds, and I think he played for eight years. He was the pride of Boston University oh, where there I you went go. to school. <laughs> he was proud of Paul Farron. I'm going to tell you, yeah, when, when he was, you know, protecting Kozar in those days, yeah. he was a much bigger guy. You're yeah. right, so I can see where the 40 pounds. Yeah, That's a great shot, though. Yeah, thank you. The NFL actually used it for uh, advertising some of their stock photography. I was surprised. They sent me a brochure. It was the centerpiece of their brochure for that next year for selling their stock photography. And I, I thought, that's pretty good for a defensive tackle to get that shot. Yeah. <laughs> so through all of those years, is there, is there a picture that you really say, boy, that's the best. Thank, I can do no better than that. One of the pictures I really like, I was actually hurt and I was on the sidelines at a Monday night game. I believe we were playing the Chicago Bears. And it's just a cast of characters that I look at. And you know, when I took it, I probably thought, well, that's just kind of an okay picture. But it's Marty Schottenheimer huddled up with a bunch of his linebackers. And I believe in the shot is um, Clay Matthews, Judge Dick Ambrose, Charlie Hall, lest I forget Bill Cower. What made it so great, do you think? It's just that all those guys went on to do great things. You know, Marty with the head coaching sure. and, and Dick Ambrose with being a judge yeah. and Clay Matthews should be in the Hall of Fame and Charlie Hall was like an all-time, you know, linebacker. And, uh, of course, Bill Cower going on to be the head coach of the Super Bowl championship Steelers. Right. Would you agree that shooting sports... It's great theater, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Does it just give you just incredible theater to put into a picture? You know, what it was for me, Jim, was kind of like a transition tool. You know, I used it for my transition because a lot of guys, they get out of the game and they never, you know, make it to the field again. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was the ability to either, you know, go to a game and shoot the game or kind of withdraw from it for a while. So I use it kind of as a tool to stay close to football and kind of pick and choose the times when I get back. 
I actually studied the transition of athletes in, uh, in college, and there's actually a body of work called Athletic Transition. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, um, one of the populations that's closest to athletes are combat soldiers. And so a lot of similarities. Of course, you have to honor combat soldiers because they're fighting for our country and Absolutely. they could get killed. But it's the same kind of thing. They go in, you know, you go in with a small group of guys, close culture, medals, trophies, uh, and you go in alone and you come out alone. So it's really a lonely feeling coming out of sports. Mm. So tell me about you became a, you are a counselor. Um, I got a master's in psychology. I was a child counselor and I was actually counseling some NFL athletes, which is not too much different than being <laughs> yeah. a child counselor. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And then I moved into the world of mentoring. So I've been a consultant for the state of California since about 1995, helping youth mentoring programs, kind of like Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Jerry, do you, have you always stayed in touch with the Browns and been interested in what they've done and this road that we've been on, which has been long? <laughs> You know, you were a very, very important part of it, and I mean this, not because you're oh, sitting you. across from me, but when we were lost and had lost them right. in 95, you and Brian really stepped up and did an amazing thing. I always say that that was amazing. Uh, when you did that documentary about losing the Browns and traveling across the country and meeting with the Browns backers right. everywhere across the country to tell what the team meant to them, and how hurt they were that they were leaving. I mean, so it's obviously never, being a Brown has never left you, in other words, has it? It, it hasn't. It, it was such a big part of you know, my life and Brian's life. And Brian Sipe and I lived close to each other in California. And when this whole thing was coming down, we were you know, meeting and looking at each other going, how could this happen? The Cleveland Browns not being in Cleveland. And so we got some backing. We got an RV. We headed cross country. We're, our goal was to come to the last game. We interviewed Browns backers all across the nation. We stopped in Arizona and, and had barbecues with them. And we stopped in Dayton and somebody called us outside and there's their VW bug that's actually a Browns helmet and stuff like that. And guys, people were coming up to us and wanting us to be counselors or something. They, they're, one guy said, you know, Jerry, my name's Bob. I'm known as Bob the Browns fan. He goes, what do I do? I what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. What do I do without the Browns? So the Browns were a huge part of my life and, and Brian's life, too. So we came back and we went to that last game and not knowing if the Browns would ever come, come back. I remember being downtown and uh, anytime you met somebody in the street and the word Cleveland Browns, the two words Cleveland Browns were said that the tears would just start flowing and they had the digital signs like up above, yeah. save the Browns right, and, right. and all this stuff. It was like a war zone back here. It really was. It, it was, was like almost being under what they used to call martial law. Right. And, and nobody knew what to do. What do we do? Do you call the league? Right. What do we do? Right. Do we pass the hat? Try and buy the team? <laughs> yeah, you know, right. it's a lot of hats. Right. But right. you didn't know what to do. Right. And luckily, the the people I think really saved the Browns. I think it's the most unbelievable grassroots right. campaign I have seen to force a huge power like the NFL to expand again far before they ever wanted to. Right. But to right a wrong. Right. Right. Yeah, right, and the, the people of Cleveland actually made the NFL say uncle, really, yeah. for, for, the, for, the, for right. the first time. It was amazing. What is your favorite moment as a Brown? And you've talked about that stadium a lot. Yeah. And you're kind of talking like the photographer, because yeah. that, that old stadium, as decrepit as it was, it was stately when it was full, I thought. I thought it was just unbelievable when it, it was. was full, those, those, those balconies. A couple, a couple of moments, Jim. One was just walking through the tunnel. And I actually think I have a picture of Doug Deacon that I took walking through the, the tunnel. Uh, but in our locker room, what that stadium was built, what, 1932 mm. for the Olympics? The Olympics, came. right, right. And so the, the, we shared a, a locker room with the Cleveland Indians. We came out through their dugout, but in that old locker room, it used to drop down a wooden stairwell right. into a long kind of like tunnel going underneath the stadium that had to be maybe 150, 200 right. feet long. And so when we walked on those uh, those old boards, they're probably two by 12, you know, lumber, uh, our cleats would hit on that. And, and 
right at first, before they had fluorescent lighting, they had these little light bulbs hanging out, so it was dark. And it was like we were gladiators coming through a cave. We would touch the guy in front of us because you didn't want to trip, you couldn't really see, and you're really nervous because you're going out to fight a battle. And the first guy, and you might be the 30th guy in line, the first guy pops up at the Cleveland Indians dugout. The fans see that person and the roar comes up that tunnel. And I can still, you know, right now the hair on the back of my yes. neck, it's like I'm doing it right now. And that's before the first snap. <laughs> right. The ball hasn't even been snapped. But you talk to any Cleveland Brown of that era, you know, what, 19... 46 to to whenever the stadium was demolished they'll tell you about walking out the tunnel there's no other tunnel in the nfl that that had that and then just like not one particular game but i can remember being in that stadium where the crowd was so fired up that you talk about home field advantage and and i recall once when we were playing the the Cincinnati Bengals, I couldn't tell you what year it was, but the crowd was just so on fire that they didn't stop even between plays. And during the plays, the, the roar of that place, I can remember running along just wondering, is the sound coming up through the ground, through my feet, through my knees? And it, it was the kind of adrenaline producing sound that you know, the ball carrier's down there and you're looking over and the center's right there. Well, I can't get to the ball carriers, but I'm going to take the center <laughs> right now. And the center's going, what did you do to do yeah. that, you know? It's just that orange helmet coming out of that dugout was right. unbelievable to me. Right. And usually our, you know, our colors were not that you know, prolific. They were just like orange helmet and white white stuff with a brown right. with a brown stripe. But people people love that. Yeah. Um, Brian Sype, your good friend, uh -huh. told a story that they, he had never felt sound like there was a Monday night game and the Browns were playing the Dallas Cowboys, right. both undefeated, I think, going into the game. Yeah. And he said it was just unbelievable, the sound in the stadium for an hour before the game. But he said he had never felt sound, but it sounds like, you know, that's what you felt too, is sound. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would draw on that. You know, talking to Brian, he might feel it before the game, after the game, but talking to him, he kind of, you know, the, the crowd goes away for him because he's got all these different parts. For me as a defensive tackle, I would take it in yeah. and go, I'm going to, you know, you know, like the little shop of horrors, you know, feed me <laughs> with this sound. And so I would go crazy. I do remember that game. It was actually my last good game. I think that was my 10th year. And Lyle Alzado was the defensive end next to me. So Lyle gets hurt. And they put Jack Gregory in, who I mentioned earlier. He was my mentor, but he'd gone to the Giants, and then he came back at the end of the mm -hmm. career. So the Cowboys hadn't practiced against me and Gregory. We still had our chemistry from years before. I didn't realize this till I watched the, the game maybe you know 10 years after I retired. And I went, oh, Alzado went down. They put Gregory in, and we did these stunts where we could just like brush off of each other. I, I was I had like three and a half sacks that game on Staubach, and and my body felt like old old old, but it was just kind of like you know the, the two old guys they know where to be and, and how to how to <laughs> yeah how to how to play with each other. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. It was a great ride. You bet, I enjoyed it. Jerry Shirk joining us. Make sure you join us next week for Club Forty Six, driven by Bridgestone. Thanks for watching, everyone.